Hello and welcome back to the preview show. It is the first one of the year. It's 2023. We are at last going to get some road cycling back on the TV. And I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Harper, now of Team Jaco Alula. I think that's how I'm going to say it, Chris. I don't know if you've got any inside information on that. Uh, not yet. So, uh, so hopefully <laughs> we'll just go with right. Alula. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Chris, welcome. Great to have you back. I uh, had you back this time last year. Uh, yeah. I'm um, thinking you're pretty excited for the race coming up this weekend. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. And yeah, like you said, looking forward to getting back racing. Feels like so, it's been a while since uh, yeah. Lombardia. <laughs> since we spoke last, you've obviously made the switch of teams. So you've you've switched over from Jumbo Visma. Uh, you're back with an, an Aussie team now, uh, which will give you a quite a lot of teammates for this race. Uh, but what what was behind your your decision to 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 make the change over to to Jaco? I think the main thing for me was just, you know, just talking to the team and sort of the opportunities and where they sort of saw me as a rider and sort of the potential of where I'd slot into the team and the sort of role I could play within the team. For me, it just felt like a nice, I guess, good way to put it would be progression for myself um, and just sort of excited me with the with the plans that they had. So that was that was pretty much just the main reason. I mean, obviously, so, uh, moving to an Aussie team is also pretty easy. You think, uh, yeah, he can slot in with the uh, with the culture and already know most of the guys on the team. So I think that also makes it an easy choice. Now, looking back at last year, uh, I rewatched the race today just to remind me of it. I don't ever recall a road race kicking off so early. I mean, last year we're talking about 100k to go. I think yourself and Dudbridge attacked. And it continued yeah. on like that for about 20k. You got a group off the front, then Platt did a big effort on the climb. They got it all back together. But by that point, there was, I think the, the field was down to about 20 or 30 riders. It, it seemed very chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the last, yeah, definitely last year was quite chaotic. And I think it, it, yeah. A few years I've done nationals, it can be really sort of hectic in the first three laps or it can go the opposite way and it can be, you know, not a heap going on. I think a lot of it just depends on who you've actually got in the race in terms of riders. And obviously, obviously the last couple of years have been a bit different with COVID and all that with some guys not wanting to come back and do the nationals because of the all the quarantine rules and that. Um, whereas having a bit of a look so far, I think it looks like there's quite a few guys come back and going to be in the road race. So it'll be uh, interesting to see how it plays out. Looking back, I think last year, because Bike Exchange didn't have a strong team, yeah, well, not as strong as previous years, it really just seemed like everybody just thought, let's just go for it. Uh, yeah. You, you attacked, I mean, you were attacking really early. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, definitely last year they didn't have anywhere near the numbers that they have had. But I think also uh, the, the the cycling domestically is, I think, you know, a few years ago I can remember you had now, now what's called Bridge Lane, obviously one of the biggest teams in Australia. And, you know, they always had a strong... Uh, a strong group of riders, but also a few years ago, you had like teams like Budget Fort Lifts with lots of guys in the race. You had Drapak, which was the pro continental team. So you had all these big teams that were, you know, all had ambitions and, you know, there to be a bit more control. Whereas last year, it sort of just felt like just chucking everyone in. It was more like a, felt more like a club race, like everyone just, you know, smash themselves and then uh, we'll see what happens at the end. <laughs> and it, it seemed like yourself and Luke Durbridge cancelled each other out. Whenever one of you attacked, the other one seemed yeah. to chase. Uh, yeah. Were you aware at the time that Plap was kind of, I don't want to disrespect him, but, he, you know, he was he was sitting on. It wasn't doing anywhere near yeah. the amount of work that, that you two were doing. Yeah, I think uh, I think probably Durbo and I both realised that, you know, late in the race, we thought, oh, we screwed up here because, yeah, I think we were both really focused on each other. And, yeah, like you said, a lot of the time, 
if Durbo did something, I'd fix it and vice versa. If I did something, Durbo would fix it. And we gave not just Platt, but we gave a lot of good riders a free ride, um, which, I mean, for Durbo and I, it's also mentally frustrating because, you know, a lot of the the riders there at a continental level in Australia, you, once they're with you, they won't do anything with you because you're the world tour rider and it's your responsibility. So sometimes that gives, uh, I mean, it gives good opportunity for some riders to sort of sneak off the front. Whereas if Durbo and I want to do anything, there's about 10 guys uh, chasing just to uh, jump on the wheel. But yeah, we definitely, um, yeah, I'd say underestimated, but I think as the race played out, we sort of also just, you know, not forgot about Plappy, but didn't didn't really uh, give him as much attention as what we should have, that's for sure. And in typical, uh, well, this road race in particular fashion, the winning move didn't go on the climb. We spend all the time usually talking about Mount Bunyong and the, the winning move goes on the flat. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because everyone says like, oh, you need to change it, Bunning Young, and, you know, it only suits suits climbers and that sort of thing but you know i completely disagree i think the the years of the race that i've uh been up there or on the podium most of the time the winning move goes on a different bit of the course not the climb at all it's actually a really hard climb to make a difference especially if you uh if you get a headwind up mount bunny young it's almost impossible to get people off your wheel it's not like it's some crazy uh tough climb and i think You've seen that over the years, you know, like someone like Richie can never really shake everyone on the climb and go solo and win. So he hasn't been able to win nationals. Whereas you get a rider like um, Garens who can pretty much rock up. No one can get rid of him on the climb. No one can beat him in the sprint. And it's, uh, yeah, he almost made it look like a piece of, <laughs> yeah, piece of cake. <laughs> and for years you've been fighting against... Bike Exchange or Orica or whatever they've been called. You've finished a second, you've finished a third, and now you've gone and joined the dark side. So now you're now you're yeah. you're in with the in with the Bike Exchange boys, Jaco Alula. Yeah. Uh, the team you're bringing this year is very strong. Nine men: yourself, Dudbridge, Hamilton, Hepburn, Matthews, Quick, O'Brien, Porter, Scottson. Uh, I've not seen the official start list yet, but I would imagine that will be the strongest team by a considerable distance. Uh, uh, some of the other teams this year, Bridge Lane in particular, don't look particularly as strong on paper, but you'll know more about the kind of local riders than I would do. How? What do you think going into the race having such a strong team? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's always going to be a benefit on that course if you have a strong team, just because I think it allows us to be on the front foot all the time. Um you know, unless we screw it up, of course. But <laughs> I think when you look on paper, uh, the guys we have in the team, I think, you know, there's a scenario where pretty much everyone in the team can win the race. Uh, and, yeah, I think also having having a rider like Bling coming back and uh, doing the Nationals, obviously, I think um, a lot of people will probably focus on Bling because, as I said, you know, like with Gero, it's sort of a nice course for uh, Bling where it could be really hard for people to get rid of him on the climb, but you can't imagine too many guys being able to beat uh, Bling in a kick at the end of a hard day like that. So, yeah, I think it's great for us having a strong team, but I'm not 100% sure on the start list, but I know there's, you know, a couple other World Tour teams that have got a couple riders in there. So I think that could make for particularly the start of the race, you know, really important for us to uh, to sort of set up the race properly. And it's been a long time since uh, we've had a breakaway win. Uh, but as you mentioned, yeah. like you've got, so Lotto are there with three riders, Caleb including, yeah. Ben O'Connor's there, Jay Vine's there, Flap's there, Clark, uh, Chris Hamilton. Uh, I think he's got a teammate as well, the young guy, Denham. Uh, yeah. So, Looking at it on paper, it's the best start list we've seen here for a number of years. Uh, yeah. But I suppose the the presence of the, the proper climbers like O'Connor and Vine, who will obviously want to try and drop people on the climb, you then get Ewan, who nobody will want to take to the, the finishing line either. Uh, how do you see that sort of dynamic going within the race? 
Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what uh what Ben and Jay want to do because, yeah, I guess they're in a similar position to me where, you know, the only way they probably really feel confident about it is if they get away by themselves uh, solo. You know, I, I can't imagine they're really wanting to take uh, take too many people to the line. So, um, yeah, as I said, it could make it quite quite aggressive at the start even um yeah in previous years once you get those sort of couple good riders on the uh, on the start list but they don't really have a team to support them i think it either goes two ways and you either see them race super aggressive at the start to try and you know make it a small group early or you don't you they sort of race like plappy did last year and you, they don't really do anything and just sort of hope the race develops in a way that they can um they can make a difference in the in the final and this time of the year is often my favorite because we have nothing to compare anything to i know there's been the bay crits there's been a little bit of racing and you get so much gossip and rumors coming over from australia about us oh, yeah we saw so and so and he was smashing it. We've seen so and so, and he's smashing it. So, how's your legs just now? How's how's your winter slash summer been? Yeah, I'm actually I'm I'm happy with uh, my preparation into into the summer. I've uh, been able to have a really nice consistent block of uh, block of training here in Adelaide. So no, I feel like I'm in good shape. Had a good rest after last season, and then um, got back into other things. And I think. Yeah, obviously having a having a hard finish to last year as well probably helped me uh, come up a little bit quicker this year. After a couple of weeks, I started to feel pretty decent on the bike again, which um, yeah, maybe just finishing the welter and then a couple hard days in the, those Italian classics. So now I'm really uh, I'm I'm quite happy where I'm at going into not just nationals but obviously the week after we've got down under and then after that Cadells. So. I think I'm in a pretty good nick for the whole Aussie summer. And you have you heard any rumours about who else is in for him? No, not really. Actually, I keep pretty uh, pretty out of all that that sort of stuff. And I think as well being uh, being here in Adelaide, you uh, you're a bit away from it. You know, sometimes you hear the uh, especially there's a lot of a uh, lot of crits and that in Victoria. So uh, I think a few of the guys do that and. <laughs> You sometimes uh, hear, oh, this guy's flying and that. But, yeah, like you said, we actually don't – I can't really think of any way that at the moment there's there's no real – other than the Bay Crits, you haven't really seen anyone race for a while. And particularly, you know, a lot of the pros coming back, some of them have just come back from their uh, pre-season team camps in Spain or whatever. So you don't really know how everyone's um, – how everyone's traveling at the moment or whether it's a big focus for them or they're just doing it because they're in Australia and they think, why not? So yeah, it'll be interesting. I have heard one little story and that is yeah. a certain defending champion, Luke Platt, uh, was in a pretty bad crash uh, in Tassie a, a, a few weeks back. Oh, really? Uh, obviously, he's going to be racing and he raced in the Bay Crits and he looked like he was, he was certainly, I think that first day, he was controlling it for the, the sprint. Uh, but yeah. I'm hearing that he's he's now back to a reasonable level, but potentially not at the level required to to challenge for the win. Ah, uh, wait. After last year, I'm not going to believe that <laughs> if he tells me. <laughs> <laughs> now, looking at the weather, <laughs> looking, as, as I say, take it with a pinch of salt because these stories are usually. <laughs> uh, in terms yeah. of weather, it's it's going to be a hot one. We're looking at 32 degrees. You are a rider who who doesn't mind a bit of heat. Yeah, I, I normally enjoy racing in the heat, so it doesn't really bother me. But yeah, it is a is a bit of an extra dynamic. I think normally, yeah, the years I've done nationals where it's been a hot day, it's um it's really killed a lot of the field. So uh, yeah, if it is hot, I think it could. Especially we've had a pretty uh most of you know here in Adelaide and also the eastern states I think we've had a pretty pretty rubbish summer really so far it's been pretty pretty cold a lot of the time compared to what we normally get I think it's normally only been at the moment it's been the western states have had a bit of more proper summer so yeah it could be a good thing for someone like uh even Ben O'Connor I'm sure he's 
used to training in the heat now. Whereas, yeah, guys from uh, Victoria and that might not might not have had as many days to uh to get used to it yet. And you mentioned the wind earlier. That can all play a big part in the race. It, it looks like not much of a wind. It's it's kind of starting from the northwest, and as the day goes on, it's kind of coming from the west, which will mean a tailwind uh, up the climb. But it's only, I mean, it's like eight k an hour. It's yeah, it's nothing, but it's not a headwind. So That's potentially good. <laughs> good news for those who want an attacking race and, and a fast climb. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it is. It's always uh, does it. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it should, but it always does play a big factor. If you get a uh, get the wrong wind up Mount Bunning Young, it can make it pretty. Yeah, you can give some guys pretty good sit on the wheel. So, yeah, for me, it's definitely. Uh, I'm definitely happy if it's not a headwind. Now, looking ahead, away from the nationals that you mentioned already, you're going to race two down under, and the Cadell race. Uh, the team look to be taking a, a super strong team into two down under. No Wollonga Hill this year, uh, but Cotscrew Road is back, and we have Mountain Lofty uh, brought into the race. Uh, how do you think the absence of uh, Wollonga Hill is going to change the race? Yeah, I mean, it's nice to mix it up. I think we still got Wollonga Hill once and then come back down and then finish in the town. Um, but, yeah, it does does change it a little bit. I, I think it's nice that they've mixed it up. Uh, it would have been would have been nice to have maybe a finish sort of still, you know, like the corkscrew finish is still uh, at that stage. In the past, you've sort of seen a group get away, but they can also get brought back just before the line by um by quite a big group coming coming back so uh, it is interesting how it'll i think it'll be a pretty i mean they've changed the stages but for me it still feels kind of similar dynamic or similar in the sense of who can win um the race overall i think you could have someone who, you know, a climber, you someone like Richie Port who can just be exceptional at corkscrew and um, create a create a gap, and that sort of decides the GC. Or again, you could sort of see, you know, a lot of guys on similar sort of level, and it comes down to those bonus sprints again. And that final stage, Mount Lofty, is that a claim you know? Yeah, Mount Lofty um, is actually. Uh, only about five k from where I am at the moment. So we do um, we do loops and uh, on Mount Lofty, but Mount Lofty's quite more like a it's quite a short, not super fast, but quite an explosive climb. Um, I, for me, I'd picture it. Yeah, unless again, unless anyone's like really exceptional and can uh can really make a difference it's uh it's probably more of one that you know might finish with a with a couple guys having a bit of a kick because it's i was looking at the numbers and the stage is a short one it's only 112k but there's 2800 yeah. meters of climbing which thinking about it is probably the most climbing i think we've ever seen in the tour down under uh, yeah, but a lot of that is at the start. I think there's a big climb at the very, very start of the race, and then you go into the laps. Yeah, I think we go go up the freeway, um, start down in the city up the freeway, and then we start doing the laps. And I mean, the laps are, you know, it's rolling the whole time. It's not never really a, a flat flat bit of road. So so it could be hard, but like you said, it's also quite a short stage. But I think. A lot of the time with Down Under, as far as I can remember, anyway, a lot of it really requires someone being super exceptional on these stages to make a difference. You know, like, I mean, obviously Richie's the uh, always been been the guy on Balanga, but also like what he's been able to do on even something like Paracombe. But other than that, there's never really been these crazy time gaps or anything it's more just you know having one guy or even corkscrew it's it's only ever been that i think it was cadell one year one at solo and then um garen thomas one at one year solo but other than that there's never really between that it hasn't been crazy crazy big gaps so i think um i guess it's exciting for the race because you 
you don't really know what sort of rider can win the overall, but yeah, yeah, it should be it should be interesting actually. Especially with them throwing in, throwing in a, a prologue in the opening stage. I thought that was quite a nice move. Yeah, yeah, the prologue should be cool. It's down uh down down in the city just on the, the tyrants there. So um I think it's uh, a lot of a bit of the course is actually where they used to do uh the criterium on the last day um a while ago. So that'll be really cool, actually. And I mean, I think things like that are always pretty spectator friendly as well, which is nice to nice to be able to do something like that. And then looking ahead, once you finish your block in Australia, uh, what, where are you heading after? Uh, after Cadell's, I'll I'll head back to Europe pretty a few days after, um, and then I think I'll do a bit of a bit of work at altitude, and then my first race in Europe will be Paris Nice. Cool. And last year, I was just thinking back to your season last year. Some highlights, definitely. Your performance in the Dauphiné, I thought that was pretty exceptional. You were working the front, uh, to be fair, but you lasted a long, long way into a lot of those stages. Uh, and also the Vuelta, too. Uh, that opening time trial, how good was that when you smashed everybody? Uh, it was pretty cool, yeah, for sure. I, I was so nervous in the bus before, especially after we went and did the... Uh the recon ride of it I was just thinking oh, I don't want to screw this up or <laughs> um, all that especially when you uh, look at the guys that you gotta gotta chop off with but no it was so cool uh, especially to get over the line and actually know we won and you know we were sort of the home team so everyone was uh, super happy but yeah it was also pretty cool to um, to be able to get Robert in the in the red jersey as well that was, uh, I think that was pretty special. And the Vuelta itself, again, you you were doing a lot of work uh, for Primoz, but you were looking super impressive. You seemed to kind of get stronger as the year kind of progressed. Obviously, Dauphiné kind of June time, and then you've kicked on the Vuelta at the end. When you end the season pretty strong, does that help you mentally uh, over the winter? Yeah, I think so. And I think as well... Because I've had a couple setbacks uh, the seasons before, I, I hadn't actually gotten a grand tour in my legs yet. So um, I think it was really important to be able to do the Volta and get that in my legs. And like I said, I felt like this year when I got back on the bike and got training, it sort of came a, a little bit quicker because I had, I guess, because I had the Volta and then a few hard one day races at the end of the year. I feel like uh, I got back to some decent shape quicker. So yeah, I hope so. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll keep <laughs> yeah I'll I'll go with the positive attitude and, <laughs> and say that it's uh, it's uh, helped me towards this season for sure. Well, we'll see a little bit uh, this weekend. So Chris, thank you very much for your time. Uh, best of luck this weekend. Be cheering you on. Hoping to see you claim that jersey at last. And best of luck for the rest of the season. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.